Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters, this is Brother Ijaz Ahmad and today uh, we will actually be testing out our new camera so we actually got a new entire system up and running this time so we have an extremely new camera we do have upgrades to the sound uh, that will actually happen in the next couple of days God willing inshallah but this is just a quick test for the camera as you can see one of the complaints we got previously was that the camera quality with the camera quality it was difficult to ascertain or to make out what the pages in the books I was showing was saying so we wanted to alleviate that problem so while I was in London I picked up a couple of things while I was in Hong Kong I picked up another couple of things with the main idea behind it being let me get proper equipment so that we can share the material inshallah now one of the other complaints not complaints but requests I received was that a lot of the arguments that I was presenting from the Greek New Testament, many of them were difficult to show Christians without having first read a Greek New Testament or knowing how to use it, etc. So the arguments today that I'll be showing to you, are, they're very simple. You can use the English, you don't need the Greek, and it makes simple common sense. And so I, I thought it would be sufficient for us to begin with the first book of the New Testament, uh, Matthew. And then, of course, um, the first book or the first chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. So today in front of us, we have the Nestle Allen. We have the Novum Testamentum Gracie or the Greek New Testament. And it's in Greek and English. It's the 28th edition of the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament. So let's inshallah hope this works. You should be able to see the words on the page. And wow, mashallah, that actually looks really good there. I'm actually surprised at the quality myself. You can actually make out the words on the page this time, inshallah. I hope so. So, uh, in Matthew chapter 1, there's a very simple argument you can bring when it comes to inconsistencies in the New Testament. We're going to go all the way down to uh, Matthew chapter 1. And I just realized one of my chords was in the way. Let me move that really quickly. There we go. Right. So... In Matthew chapter 1, you will see that uh, the angel Gabriel, or angel of the Lord, has come to Mary. And she's telling Mary, sorry, the angel is telling Mary what the name of her child would be. Now, we know her as Mary, Mary, uh, may I be pleased with her. And we know that his name is, the, the name of the son that she bears is Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary. Now, what does the angel command her that the name of the, her son will be? She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. And why is he named Jesus? For he will save his people from their sins. Okay, that's common sense. It's pretty much very simple. Uh, the angel tells Mary, name your son Jesus. That's the end of it. And his name means that he will save the people from their sins. Now, we have two translations. I believe we have the um, NRSV and we have, I think the other one. I forgot the other one actually. But uh, if you look in front of me, it also says, and you shall give him the name Jesus. That's what it says. So let's turn to the next page now. What do they actually name him? <laughs> so it says that you will name him Jesus. But then the angel goes on to say that there's actually a prophecy. And the prophecy is, and they shall name him Emmanuel. Do you see that? They shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son. And he named him Jesus. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. So again, it's a very simple argument. In the English, the angel prophesies that they will call him Jesus, as you can see here. In the very next couple of verses, Joseph wakes up from a dream, also names him Jesus. But the prophecy is that they will name him Emmanuel. They don't name him Emmanuel, they name him Jesus, a completely distinct name. So the question is, doesn't this therefore demonstrate that it's a false prophecy? Yes. So one of the ways that the Christians get around this is by the word they. Right? So the word, what, what they argue is that it's not that Joseph and Mary will refer to Jesus as Emmanuel, but that the people who he saves from their sins will refer to him as Emmanuel. But then that is also a problem because that, that seems to argue that Mary and Joseph, he does not save them from their sins. 
so that argument in its entirety does not make sense. If the day here refers to people other than Mary and Joseph, then it means he did not actually save them from their sins because it says that he is named Jesus because for he will save his people from their sins. So it's a bit of a conundrum. It's a, one, it's a false prophecy, and two, it's a salvific or a salvation dilemma. How are these people saved, and are they not counted as saved because they don't actually fulfill the prophecy? So that's a really simple and easy argument. You can make it on the very first page of the very first gospel of the very first chapter of that gospel. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, uh, I forgot the verses, but it's uh, I think it's verse 21. And verse and you just go down from there, inshallah. So that's a pretty simple argument. It's basically reasonable. No one can complain about that one. But there is another one here as well. We go to chapter three, and mashallah, look at the quality of this. That's that's why I love this new camera. You can actually see the words on the page for the first time. Like I said, a lot of people complained that they couldn't make out the words. It was difficult to understand what the words were saying on the page. But we've got a new camera system invested quite a lot in it and alhamdulillah it seems to be working out so what so let's move on now jesus grows up he's an adult he has been born he goes through childhood he's an adult now alhamdulillah and what happens uh in matthew chapter 3 it introduces you to uh um to uh, yahya al -Islam, john the baptist and it tells you that john the baptist is doing baptisms and why is he doing baptisms so it says here then the people of Jerusalem, this is verse 5, and all Judea were going out to him, that is John the Baptist, and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So according to this passage, uh, the people were coming to John the Baptist to confess their sins. Uh, so how then, how does this relate to Jesus? Well, this is what happens. In verse 13 it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now the first question is, why does Jesus need to be baptized? The Christians usually don't have an answer for this, but what they argue is that it's just a rite of passage. But no, it's not a biblical rite of passage to get baptized by John. There's no prophecy which indicates this. Now let's go on. It actually says, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. So hold on now, hold on now. The only reason to be baptized is if one is confessing their sins. That's what it says up here. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now if Jesus comes to John the Baptist, and he comes to him to be baptized, then he comes to be baptized to also confess his sins. Now that's, that's what simple logic would dictate. And that would therefore imply that Jesus was sinful. Now, as Muslims, we don't believe that the prophets were sinful. This is purely a Christian and, to some extent, a Judaic belief. But Jesus, the, the implication from these passages here is that Jesus is sinful. But we don't believe that Jesus is sinful. So what do the Christians say? They say it's a rite of passage. But it's not just merely a rite of passage. It actually goes on. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. That, my friends, is a very problematic statement. Um, to fulfill all righteousness. How is that a problematic statement? Do you know why? Jesus is saying that it's a requirement to fulfill all righteousness that the Messiah is baptized for his sins. One, that's nowhere stated in the Old Testament. So where does this statement come from? Where does this requirement that righteousness can only be fulfilled by being baptized? It, it can't be found in the Old Testament. So that's a problem. Either Jesus is in this case lying, or two, if he's not lying and he's making a truthful statement, and this argument that the Messiah needs to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, is in the old is was in the Old Testament at the time of Jesus and now is no longer there because we don't find it there, then it means that the New Testament that the Old Testament is actually corrupt. So we have two options. Either Jesus lied or the Old Testament is corrupt. But there's actually a third option as well, which is that all of this is basically made up. 
I don't believe that this conversation actually happened. Now, the word here, let it be so now. Uh, let me see if I can get it in the Greek here. It should be verse 15. So here we go. So in verse 15, the word for righteousness, it's the, well, I'm not trying to be lewd here, but the word for righteousness, as you can see here, it's what we call the dick root, uh, delta iota kappa. So you can see it here. Uh, I believe that is the uh, dikayo sunen. Yeah, I hope I got that right. Dikayo uh, sunen. So it basically means righteousness. Uh, it's called uh, the D-I-K root word. Now, Jesus says here, let it be so now. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. Now, th there's a problem with that because if you look in the Greek here, it's the word aphes. Uh, aphes. What does aphes mean? Let it be so now. Aphes. Aphes. Where does that come from? Do you know where that comes from? That word aphes? It doesn't mean let it be so now. It actually means forgive me. It means forgive me. Because in the Lord's Prayer, when you say... Uh, Forgive us our trespasses, the word that you use is aphes. But you see they translated here as let it be so now. I, I challenge anyone, you go to the Lord's Prayer in any of the Gospels, I believe it's in two Gospels, and you look at the word for forgive us our sins, it's the word aphes. And Jesus says that, he says, let it be so now, so forgive, uh, in order for my sins to be forgiven, it is proper in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Therefore, we understand why the word righteousness now is used in the sentence because righteousness, in order for righteousness to be gained, sin has to be forgiven. And this ties in with the context where it says that people have been baptized in the way of also confessing their sins. So what does all of this imply? It basically implies in the Greek and in a plain reading of the English, that Christ Jesus was sinful as Muslims reject that. Two, it teaches us that they fudge the translations, that they play with the translations. The word affairs here in the I think you can see it in the bottom left corner. While I come Islam to the people that joined, I'm only now seeing your comments, so I do apologize. It's a new camera setup. So at the end of today, the these are two very simple arguments. Two very simple arguments. I'm going to review them again really quickly. So let me go back really quickly. We go back to Matthew chapter 1. Uh, the, uh, an angel of the Lord comes to Mary, tells her that her son, will, his name will be uh, Jesus. Where was it? You are to name him Jesus. Joseph wakes up, names him Jesus, but the prophecy is that they will name him Emmanuel. So it's a false prophecy or they lied, one of the two. The other argument was the purpose of baptisms is to confess sins. Then you can see the on top here, confessing their sins. The word used for let it be so now is aphes, and that means to for, uh, ask for forgiveness of one's sins, or trespasses or sins. And this fits in with the context of let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. You can only fulfill all righteousness if you do away with sins. So the overall context, like I said, either makes Jesus into a sinner or who, one who is sinful. And as a Muslim, I must necessarily reject this. Now, these are the problems you find within the first three chapters of the very first book of the New Testament, the Gospel according to Mark, allegedly. So, brothers and sisters, we, we don't have to, what's the word here? We don't have to go into complicated Greek. We don't have to look at the manuscripts. A plain reading in the English should actually teach us these things. And we, we should not be afraid to read this book, the New Testament. We should not be afraid to point out the contradictions because these books are given away for free. Well, not this edition. This, this edition is definitely not given away for free. It's something like $50 or like $50 US dollars, that is a £50. Pound. But whatever the case is, you read these, this book, and you come across so many contradictions and changes that it possibly cannot be from God. And that is my problem. I read it and I've never actually received a answer to this question. Why does Jesus say, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness? Where does this requirement of a baptism come from? If you read the biblical commentaries, they all say this is a difficult situation because it's not mentioned in the Old Testament. Which means one of two things, either Jesus lied or the Old Testament is corrupt. It's that simple. There is nowhere where this um, uh, requirement comes from. The funny thing is Jesus says this and immediately John the Baptist says, then he consented. So immediately after Jesus says this, John the Baptist baptizes him. 
which means he knew of this command, but it can't be found. So where does it come from? It must come from an extra biblical source. It must mean that the Bible is insufficient in some way because this, this, this passage introduces confusion to us. If we are Jews in the first century and we are being told that a baptism needs to happen for the fulfillment of all righteousness, but we can't find this teaching anywhere in the Old Testament, then I'm going to reject Jesus as the Messiah. That's what's going to happen. So the Christians have set it up in such a way that a Jew at that time had no other choice but to reject the Messiah. So you know what? You know, Alhamdulillah, we are Muslims and we don't fall into these pitfalls. Alhamdulillah, that Allah has guided us to accept Jesus, peace be upon him, as the Messiah. And we accept him as such without these difficulties. Alhamdulillah, that we were spared from this. In any case, guys, I just want to wrap up there. This was just a really quick test, a really quick video to answer one question I got and also to test the new camera that we got. And I have to say I'm really happy with the quality that uh, I'm looking at here on the phone screen. The words are absolutely clear. Please let me know in the comments if it's blurry to you or anything or if it's out of focus or if it's you know fuzzy in any way because we want to get a setup right for the future videos inshallah so thank you for your time and uh, just a quick reminder we will um be having a q a about my um about my uh, time at hyde park and sorry about that guys just sort a quick technical glitch there as i'm trying to wrap up so yeah very quickly again um we will be trying to have a q a video about my time at Speakers Corner Hyde Park, about the events that transpired there and the fun that we had because the videos, alhamdulillah, have surpassed 100,000 views. Uh, I think it's at 120,000 right now in total. Uh, that's 120,000 views from the events at Hyde Park. And I'm actually looking forward to telling you guys all about the fun that we had. So thank you very much for your time. Assalamu alaikum wa Bye-bye.